Development Seminar Series, the Circa ABSS, is meant to encourage the presentation and discussion of development and research issues, as well as their implications to agricultural and rural development. Thus, we encourage the audience to engage in the open forum after our speaker's presentation. To start with, our speaker for today is a homegrown talent, so to speak. He graduated summa cum laude from the University of the Philippines, Los Banos, with a bachelor's degree in biology. Don't ask me what this GWA is. <laughs> so armed with a PhD in molecular biophysics and biochemistry from Yale University, he conducted various research studies in molecular biology, genomics, biochemistry, and genetics. He was a research fellow at Harvard Medical School, Massachusetts General Hospital, and a visiting scientist at the National Institute for Basic Biology based in Japan, University of Cambridge, England, and the International Rice Research Institute. He must have really wanted to become a lawyer because he went to Harvard Law School and received his Juris Doctor or JD degree from this highly prestigious university in 2004. With Harvard Law School's approval and financial support, he spent several weeks here in UPLB to get a first-hand glimpse of the challenges that confront our country with regard to intellectual property protection, specifically patent protection and biotech research. His interest in patent law likewise brought him to DuPont, where he was a patent liaison for biotech research for more than two years. In this capacity, he was involved in drafting and prosecuting patent applications and developing strategies for intellectual property portfolio management and protection. Currently, he is a patent attorney in the Washington, D.C. office of Finnegan, Henderson, Farabow, Garrett, and Donner LLP the largest law firm in the world specializing in intellectual property law. His practice currently focuses on patent litigation and patent application drafting and filing, mainly in the areas of biotechnology and pharmaceuticals. Ladies and gentlemen, here to talk about the general patentability of agricultural research outputs, please welcome Dr. Lawrence Ila. Thank you, Ms. Kim, for the nice introduction. Um, so, uh, there was just one thing I'd like to correct in the yeah. introduction. So, I'm no longer employed at Finnegan Henderson, Firewall, Garrett, and Dunn. Yeah, so, I quit my job last year, October 31st, to be specific. And he's now a public scientist here in the oh, yeah, I forgot that. Yes. A campus, Philippine Genome Center. So I'm here for three months and then who knows what's going to happen after like March or April this year. Um, I just want to also make sure that everyone understands Tagalog or can I speak in Tagalog? So everyone yeah. here understands Tagalog, okay. So, so that's good. So my topic for this afternoon is patentability of agricultural research outputs. And the right to patent is a right that is based in the Constitution. Okay, here in the Philippines as well as in other countries of the world. So here in this slide, we show you or I show you the section of the Philippine Constitution of 1987, which says, the state shall protect and secure the exclusive rights of scientists, inventors, artists, and other gifted citizens to their intellectual property and creations, particularly when beneficial to people, for such period as may be provided by law. So this provision in the 1987 Constitution makes specific reference to intellectual property, which is the tangible output of the creative process of gifted individuals like scientists and inventors. So their products, their research and development, 
So this provision specifically secures or provides that the state shall protect the intellectual property of scientists and inventors in their research and development. And here in the Philippines and in other countries, one way to protect the intellectual property in research is the patent system. Okay, and the patent system is designed to protect intellectual property, most uh, particularly in the scientists. So you could think of your intellectual property as sort of a piece of land, and the patent would be like a fence that you build around that piece of land. So a patent would enable you to control the use of the intellectual property that you've developed. So you can control who gets to use your invention or your research and for what terms are they able to use. So by being able to control the property, you're in a better position to uh, do the research and development uh, that you envision based on that research. So the patent specifically gives you the right to exclude others from making, using, selling, and importing the plant invention. And this right is actually an economic incentive to promote R&D. Okay, so how does it promote R&D? So the patent system is set up so that in exchange for the full disclosure of your invention in a patent application, you get to have a monopoly of the relevant market for 20 years from the date of filing. So the way it goes is that we find a patent application and then to some patent office in the world and then after some back and forth with a patent office, if things go your way, you get a patent issued on that invention and in that patent application, you fully disclose your invention and in exchange for the patent that you got issued, the patent enables you to have the right to exclude the ones that were on the other side, any potential competitors for, for 20 years, okay? And it promotes R&D, this system promotes R&D because the patent document provides full disclosure of the invention so that other people get to learn the full details of the research and therefore would be able to be able to use the information there to apply to their research. Okay? And in exchange for the information provided by the inventor or by the scientist, the researcher or the patentee gets a market monopoly of the relevant market. And you know how a monopoly works, right? So there's only one actor in the market and therefore the patentee is able to control the prices or the, the products that are on the market and therefore because of this, the patentee would be able to recoup the expenses incurred in its research and development and are able to generate revenues that he could put into his research. Okay, so an example of the value of patents is in drug discovery. Um, if you look in the internet, um, you might get like figures saying that it might take billions of pesos, right? Billions, not millions, but billions of pesos to develop a, a drug. Okay, not just here, but anywhere in the world. Okay, so one way you could incentivize people or drug companies to put in that much money, because it's a big, it's a really big amount, is for the research company to get a patent on their on their drug, right? Because with a patent, the drug company is able to monopolize the market and therefore, in exchange for the research and development that put in into the drug discovery, they're able to develop a market for that drug and because of the monopoly that the patent confers on the company, the company is able to dictate the prices of the of the drug that it sells in the market. So it's a quid pro quo. So the patent which discloses the drug discovery gives full information about drug development which other researchers are able to 
use at, a, at another time in order for them to develop other drugs. And in exchange for that information, the drug company which invented or developed the drug gets a monopoly on the market for the particular drug, which means that they're able to control the prices for that drug and get revenues and generate income for the, for the company. So you always hear about people complaining about the high prices for branded drugs. And in, in, for, I, in one respect, they're true, they're expensive. But then, you sh I guess people don't see the other side, that it takes a lot of money to develop a drug. And there's this patent system that's set up to incentivize the drug companies to put in the money needed to develop the drugs that they're enjoying today. So patents are country specific, so the right to exclude is geographically restricted, meaning uh, expenses kind of add up rather quickly if you want to protect your invention in a number of jurisdictions. Uh, so if you want to protect your cup, your product in, uh, in, uh, in another country, like in Singapore, then you have to find a patent in Singapore to protect your invention. And so this is something that I think people should appreciate because if you just patent your invention in the Philippines and not consider other parts of the world, then it might be that someone might see your patent and then practice your invention outside the Philippines. And because of that, because of the territoriality of the patent, then you, you wouldn't be able to, to, to go after them because uh, your patent is only in the Philippines and their activities are outside of the Philippines. And patent laws differ from one country to the next. They but generally exclude from patentability, not surprisingly, natural phenomena, abstract ideas, and laws of nature. So that's another thing we should keep in mind, uh, that patent laws differ from one country to the other which means that you really have to look at the laws of each country because something might not be patentable here in the Philippines but then might be patentable in another market uh, that you might be interested in for your product then you could go ahead and patent the product in that other state or country. So here's an example of the difference between patent laws of two countries, okay, like Philippines and the U.S. In the Philippines, uh, it's explicitly stated in the law that programs for computer, therapeutic and diagnostic methods in animals, plant varieties, animal breeds, and their biological production, aesthetic creations, okay, they're not patentable uh, as provided in the law. But I'm not sure whether they've been tested in a court of law, whether somebody has actually challenged what these different things mean. Um, and so we're not exactly sure what the boundaries of these exclusions are. Because like, for example, plant variety, um, you might know what a plant variety means, but then somebody else might have a different definition of plant variety. And there might be ways to go around this uh, exclusion. So we're going to talk about that in a bit. But in the US, in contrast, uh, all these are patentable in the US. And I guess the expression in the U.S. is anything made under the sun, under the sun by man is patentable, which kind of uh, stresses human innovation in a way. So as long as there's human input and it's not, it's not, it's new, it's not obvious, then it's arguably patentable in the U.S. But in the Philippines, you have all these restrictions. Okay, so we saw in the other slide that plant varieties are not patentable in the Philippines. So instead of a patent mechanism to protect intellectual property in plant varieties in the Philippines, we have what we have. We have the so-called Plant Variety Protection Act. So it's the mechanism in the Philippines to protect intellectual property in new varieties developed. Okay, it confers patent-like rights, so meaning right to exclude, others from making selling the product and longer term than patents, like 20 to 25 years from issuance of certificate 
whereas a patent has uh, 20 years from the date of filing. And it has different requirements, so you have to show that the variety is new, distinct, stable, uniform. So those are the requirements under the PVPA. But for patents, uh, they're in a way more stringent. The invention has to be new, there has to be an inventive step that's involved, and um, the invention has to have industrial applicability. Um, the PVPA also has certain exemptions, meaning there are activities that are not covered by the PVPA. So there are activities that you can do and the holder of the PVPA isn't going to go after you. So if the app is done for the purpose of breeding other varieties or if you use the breed for non-commercial purposes, then those are activities that you can do and uh, that's not included in the Protection Act. So the same exclusion is in the patent system. So for patents, as long as the act is non-commercial, then you're free to do it. But except for patents, the exclusion is stricter. So, so for patents, for the act to be non-commercial and to be exempt, it has to be, it doesn't, it has to have no economic prejudice to the patent. So it's a, it's a smaller exception in the patent system, so arguably that's one argument to go for a patent since it is a narrower exception and there are more activities that are covered uh, by a patent. Okay, but in the US, for example, I guess this is just a demonstration of the difference in patent or in intellectual property laws. In the US, uh, you have, in, in addition to the Plant Variety Protection Act, you also have other systems like a patent system to protect IP developed uh, that relates to plants. So there is this Supreme Court case in the US that specifically decided that uh, there could be different mechanisms for protecting plant, plant invention. So neither the Plant Patent Act of 1930 nor the Patent Variety Protection Act for closest utility patent coverage for plants. So in the US, actually, there are three mechanisms to protect the intellectual, intellectual property relating to plants. So you have the Plant Patent Act of 1930, which conferred plant protection to asexually reproduced plants. Then that was followed by the Plant Variety Protection Act, which conferred limited patent-like protection for certain sexually reproduce plant varieties that are new, distinct, uniform, and stable. And then you have the general utility patent statutes, okay, which govern patentability in general, which confer patent protection for inventions that are useful, novel, and non-obvious. So if you develop a plant that's useful, novel, and non-obvious, then that can also be a subject for patentability for patenting in the U.S. But what about... Uh, okay, um, let me back up a bit and then go f uh, discuss a bit about PVPA in, in ASEAN countries. Because um, there's this move, as I'm sure you've heard, of um, Philippines and the other ASEAN countries getting together, forming a single economic block, and I guess the integration is supposed to happen next year. And I thought it would be interesting to see whether there are differences in the PVPA laws in at least different ASEAN countries and see whether this would be an issue in the integration of these countries. So I just looked at five different ASEAN member nations and I just looked at a term of protection that's conferred by the PVPA and, and indeed there are differences between among the nations. So for the Philippines, the term of protection is 25 years for trees and vines and then 20 years for others. In Singapore, 25 years regardless of the plant variety. And then Malaysia goes into more detail and into more differences like 25 years for trees and vines and 20 years for others that are new, distinct, uniform and stable. And then 15 years for varieties that are new, distinct, identifiable, which is a different criteria developed and discovered by farmer, local community, and indigenous people, 
and the years are measured from the filing date, whereas these years are measured from the date of issuance of the certificate. And then in Thailand, you have another different term of protection, 12 years for this type of trees and, or plants, and then 17 years and 27 years. And then Indonesia, 25 years and 20 years. And so aside from differences in plant variety protection act provisions, there are also differences in the patenting regimes in the different ASEAN nations. So Singapore actually allows for the patenting of higher life forms. And the only exclusion from patentability that the Singapore laws provide is that if the invention is expected to encourage offensive, immoral, or antisocial behavior, then that's not patentable. So that's also not patentable in the Philippines. And then in addition to those types of inventions, animal breeds and land varieties are not patentable in the Philippines and in Malaysia. So the language in the Malaysian laws is planned for animal varieties. Indonesia's exclusion is broader, precluding all living creatures except microorganisms. Because here in the Philippines, you can make the argument that only plant varieties are excluded, but not plants per se. Because the language is plant varieties, whereas in Indonesia, it's all living creatures except microorganisms. And we'll explore that distinction a bit uh, later on. And then Thailand's, ex Thailand's exclusion is even broader than Indonesia's, precluding all the animals, plants, and even extracts from animals or plants. So the, another difference is that the Philippines does not specifically exclude from patentability extracts prepared from plants and animals, whereas, as we saw in the other slide, Thailand specifically excludes extracts from animals or plants. So I guess you've heard of the Langundi extract or the Sambong extract that's, I think, sponsored by Pasqua Laboratories. So that arguably might not be patentable in Thailand, but patentable here in the Philippines. And then Malaysia and Indonesia do not exclude plant or animal extracts for that community. Okay, so going to that detail of plant varieties and animal breeds. So that language in the Philippine patent laws of being excluded from patentability, okay, it's similar to the language of the European Patent Convention, Article 53B which precludes from patentability plant or animal varieties. Um, so if you look at the European laws, this is what they exclude. And I've talked to patent uh, practitioners here in the Philippines, and it sounds like that our patent system was, was uh, patterned after the European system. So it kind of follows that the language in the patent Philippine laws are similar to what is found in Europe. Okay. Europe, however, grants patents to plants characterized by specific genes, but not if characterized by variety. So, for example, here in this slide from the internet, so Golden Delicious would be a variety of apple, which is not patentable since it's a variety. And then variety A containing gene X would also be not patentable since it's predicated on variety A. But if you frame the claim as a, as a plant containing gene X for increasing vitamin C content, then it's patentable. So, so arguably, that kind of a system might also work here in the Philippines, since what is excluded in the Philippine laws is a plant variety and not plants per se, as is stated in Thailand or in, uh, in Indonesia. So how do you patent inventions relating to plant varieties, for example, corn variety with increased disease resistance, given that uh, background? So claims come in different sizes and shapes. So when you apply for a patent, you're writing patent application, you have a specification which would include all details of your invention, how to make and use the invention. And then at the end of the patent application, you end up with uh, list of claims, that's what they call it, claims which are actually the, are a really important part of the patent application since it really defines the means and bounds of the invention that you want to protect. Okay, and the claim can be phrased in a way that you're claiming a, it, an apparatus, like a machine or a device, a method or a process or use. 
So a method of increasing CC resistance in corn, for example, comprising the steps, blah, 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 blah. If it's an apparatus, it's uh, maybe a machine for making charcoal with improved speed, comprising the elements of blah, blah, blah. Or it's a product or composition to be a herbal composition or to be a pharmaceutical composition. So claims are drafted to claim either an apparatus, a method, or a process, or use, or a product, or a composition. So going back to the original question, uh, how do you patent inventions relating to plant varieties? Do you put, perhaps try to claim the plant, okay, but do not claim it in terms of the variety, but in terms of specific gene content. So for example, in this case, you might frame a claim as a plant containing gene X, if you know the gene, or a marker A partly linked to gene X, for disease resistance. So marker A, I think that's what people kind of do these days, like try to find markers linked to, to specific uh, genes that are correlated to uh, desired traits. So you could try that claim, or you could also try a method or use claim, claim the method of using variety A for producing corn, or use of variety A for producing corn. Or you could also claim the composition and the product. You could claim the pl plant parts, corn kernels, or the products further downstream. Corn meal prepared using variety A in corn. Okay, another research output. So that's a research output of variety. So I think that's one common output of common agricultural research output uh, that, so we just explored how to patent that since we found out that uh, plant varieties are excluded from patentability, at least here in the Philippines. So another uh, research output of agricultural research uh, can be DNA markers. So DNA markers are like short DNA fragments that are amplified from the genome that are linked to desired uh, genes. Okay, so for example here, this would be a DNA marker because it is of different lengths. So here, allele A would be this long and then allele B would be this long. And this is something that you might be interested in because it's closely located or it's tightly linked to a gene that would be of interest, which might not have been identified yet because it's harder to get. So for example, this could be a gene affecting disease resistance, as in our previous example, and you might want to identify and isolate these markers because with these markers, you're able to identify what the gene the plant has. Since if it, got, if it has an allele, then you have this normal gene most probably, and then if you have allele B, then you have this mutant gene. So it's a way of tracking the transmission of the real gene of interest. But since this gene of interest is harder to get, then people just go and uh, monitor these markers. So because of their different sizes, you're able to differentiate them either by cell recognition or by polymer chain reaction. So allele A would have a different pattern than allele B. So DNA markers, I think, are becoming a a vigorous avenue of research to monitor or to track uh, transmission of agriculturally important genes that might be related to uh, important phenotypes like uh, delayed ripening or increased disease resistance or stress tolerance. Okay, so DNA markers as research outputs, uh, they're DNA fragments, as I've mentioned, amplified from genomic DNA that are found to be linked to desired traits like disease resistance or delayed ripening. So are they patentable? So in the U.S., uh, it depends, okay? So in last year, the Supreme, there was actually a case that came up all the way to the Supreme Court which asked the question, are human genes patentable? And then the court decided last year that the genomic DNA, even in isolated form, is not patentable. 
So people who patented DNA kind of put in the word isolated to make to differentiate it from from naturally occurring genomic DNA in the body. And the US Patent Office, with that distinction, uh, issued patents because isolated kind of for the patent office signal that it's not naturally occurring and it's in purified form. And so because of that distinction, the US Patent Office issued patents on genes. So that was for so many years, actually when I was at Big Point, I kind of I guess I was part of the process or the problem. I, I was uh, completing patent applications on genes. Um, and people were doing that uh, right and left because people didn't know whether genes were patentable and rather than being left out in the dark, if companies might as well uh, patented genes in the off chance that courts would find that the patent that the gene patent would be held valid. But it turns out that those patents in some part were not patentable. Okay. Uh, in the U the US Supreme Court said that genomic DNA is not patentable while C DNA is synthesized in the lab that contain only coding sequences and therefore exclude non coding sequences are patentable. Okay, but in Australia you have a different result. The same genes Genomic, they, they find it patentable because they focused on the human effort that was put in to get the isolated form. So in the US, they look or focus on the genetic information that is reflected in the DNA that's isolated and seeing that the isolated DNA has the same genetic information as the genomic DNA in the genome, they kind of said that there's not much difference and so it's not patentable. Whereas in Australia, they focused on the human effort that was put in in isolating the isolated DNA and saying that since there's this human effort in coming up with this product that's arguably different from what is naturally occurring, they upheld the, the patent. Okay, so this is just a graphic to show you what cDNA and genomic DNA are. So you could Imagine in your cell this many strands of DNA, you have the gene, okay, this would go the protein, but then you would have parts of the DNA that do not really correspond to any part of the protein. Okay? So these are called introns, those parts of the DNA that actually do not code for anything. So when you get RNA through the process of transcription, you get those introns included but, sin, but they don't encode anything, okay? So they get spliced out of the RNA and you end up with a mature mRNA with only exons, the coding regions, and then that's what is translated to get to the protein. So the Supreme Court was saying that, you know, the US Supreme Court was saying that genomic DNA isolated is not patentable, whereas cDNA which is the DNA obtained from reverse transcribing the mRNA would be patentable since it's a product of man and it doesn't naturally exist in nature because in nature you have those introns in between the exons. Okay, so patentability of DNA sequence thus appears to turn on whether the claim fragment naturally occurs in the organism, at least in the U.S. Under this standard, DNA markers are likely not to be patentable okay, under U.S. law. Okay, but Philippine law has not specifically excluded DNA markers. So, I guess the point here is that if you want to claim your DNA markers here in the Philippines, uh, there's nothing excluding it specifically under Philippine law. And then you could also add claims directed to the kits and to the methods for analyzing or selecting plants using the DNA markers. Okay, but even if the even if, uh, invention is patentable, it doesn't mean that you're, uh, you're free, you're, you know, you're, you're okay to go. I mean, there are more requirements to get a patent. You have to show that there is industrial applicability, meaning utility. It has to be new, meaning meaning it hasn't been shown to exist or an identical form hasn't been shown to exist 
um, before you invented the whole thing. And an important thing is you have to show an inventive step or non obvious steps. So here you can include unexpected results based on prior art teachings to demonstrate that it's really inventive. So if you get something that is unexpected, then that argues for non obviousness. Or if you can show that there was difficulty in making the invention, that also helps to show non obviousness. Or if you can show later on that the product based on the patent application was really praised or got a lot of good reviews from other people, then that's another another argument for non obviousness and it presents a solution to a long tail thing. Okay, so this just, uh, this, with this slide, I just want to demonstrate that even if a DNA is patentable, even if the subject matter is patentable, it doesn't mean that you're free. Like, it's still, you still have to show that it's non obvious. So, in this case in, in the US Federal Circuit, which is the Court of Appeals in the US for patent cases, so there was a claim directed to a DNA encoding polypeptide that bind CD48 in the interaction resulting in the production of interferon, which is a useful protein used to combat viral infection. Okay, so the prior art showed that uh, this protein, CD48 binding protein, had already been isolated, but the amino acid sequence was not known. Okay? So note that the claim is directed to the DNA, okay, not the protein. So the prior art all concerns the protein. And there's also been a monoclonal antibody specific for the CDNA 48 binding protein. Good. So that's already in the prior art. Okay, but the claim was held obvious. Okay, even if the amino acid sequence was not known and therefore you had no way of designing oligos, for example, to get the DNA. Okay, the claim was obvious because the sequence or the methods used for cloning and sequencing the gene are very well known in the prior art so that it was reasonably expected that you'd be able to get the gene. So the, the Federal Circuit was arguing that, or was, they concluded that the method for getting the gene was obvious. Because if you have a monoclonal antibody, then you could use that to screen a cDNA library and then by screening the cDNA library, you could fish out the cDNA that would encode the CD48 binding protein. Okay, so, so here the court held a claim as obvious, even though there was really no way anyone could have predicted what the DNA sequence would look like. So, so there are there are tensions inherent in this type of case. For one hand, you could say that the claim was obvious because the method to get the DNA would have been obvious. It's kind of straightforward to get it. But then on the other hand, you could also think that the DNA is not obvious because you really had no idea until you get the DNA what the gene sequence or what the properties of the gene would look like. So other agricultural research outputs like apparatuses, like a biomass pelletizer, would be patentable as long as they satisfy the requirements for patentability, like novel, non-obvious, and so industrial applicability. Then you have purified enzymes for the industrial application and then fertilizers. So if you think of other agricultural research outputs that you want to be discussed whether it's patentable or not, uh, please feel free to raise it now or during the open forum. Okay, animal breeds, I guess that if you think about it, it could be uh, an output, a research output of people um, doing animal breeding or research with animals. So it's not patentable under Philippine laws we've seen. Animal breeds are specifically excluded from patentability, but there is no system analogous to the Plant Rights and Protection Act here in the Philippines or elsewhere in the world to protect intellectual property. So that's interesting, and I guess that's because, I guess, people, there aren't enough people advocating for such a system. So how do you patent inventions relating to animal breeds? 
And for example, cattle breed breed that produces more milk than other breeds. So it's not patentable, the animal breed. So you try to kind of go around that exclusion and think of how to claim your of your invention of an animal breed. So you could try an animal claim. You could try to claim the animal, but not as a breed, but as some animal that contains a specific gene or marker. You could use try a method or use claim. You could claim the method of using breed B for producing milk or use of breed B for producing milk. So the novelty and the non-obviousness would lie in the breed B. Okay, and so you have to include that in the claim. Or you could claim a composition or a product claim. You could claim animal products like milk or products further downstream, like ice cream prepared using the milk from breed B. So when you have uh, something that can be patented, doesn't mean you go ahead and patent it because like applying for a patent is expensive and therefore you also have to ask yourself, is it worth patenting the invention? So so here you have to consider the market and you also you do also try to value what your patent is worth. Because when you apply for a patent, you apply for application fee for for your lawyer, if you're, if you're hiring a lawyer, and then the annuities, the maintenance fees. So you have to evaluate the value of any potential patents, and these are some questions that you could uh, consider when um, thinking about that question. So you evaluate the importance of the invention, whether it's one of a kind or one of many. So if it's one of a kind invention, then that kind of tells you that it's really something important and something that people might be interested in and therefore you go ahead and patent it. If, it. if it's a critical component of a process or of a product, if it's easy to design around, then that might kind of dissuade you from patenting since others might just go ahead and think up or make something else instead of use the invention in your patent and the size of the market. You also consider the value of similar patents license agreements regarding similar technologies so that you get a sense of the value of your invention. And, but ultimately, you have to consider what the market can bear. You have to consider what the per particular circumstances are with respect to your invention and to your, to your potential adopters. And so if you think you're good at sales talk or you could actually persuade the other party to license your technology, then that might be something that would encourage you to go ahead and patent your invention. Um, I think that's about it. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. So the floor is now open for your questions or comments. Please use the microphone along the aisles. <coughs> Yes, sir. Uh, what 
normally happen to the patent after 20 years? Is it um, for public use or, or you still have to reapply for the patent? So, magiging public ko yun. So, after 20 years, after the expiring patent, yun, magiging, magiging public na yung, yung invention. So usually, pagkatapos ka lang, yung makikita nyo na yung presyo nung branded drug, bawa ba? Kasi nga, pwede lang ipasok yung mga generic drugs. So may competition na. So, siyempre, bawa ba ang presyo para yung drug yung bibili, yung kanilang drug yung bibili. So, so, so after 20 years, yung patent na expire, so the market is going to open for, for all. For usually, um, ginagawa ng branded companies, parang they try to find something novel or something new about the product. So they try to file another patent parang to, parang to extend yung, yung protection of the job nila. So sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, 